The conclusion of my previous lecture may make it sound like we're doomed to wallow in partisan subjectivity. There are no objective facts. Common ground and consensus on important issues will erode. Biased media will proliferate and further fracture society. Yet in response to this atomized, fractured public square, many people experience a deep hunger for genuine, embodied community. On the one hand, this hunger can be satisfied in unhealthy ways. For instance, as church affiliation wanes and we increasingly bowl alone, we become lonely and isolated, hence the weak ties that join us to our fellow newsies, those who take a daily dose of morning edition or peruse the front page of the paper of record, become more essential to our identities. Pastor Tim Keller identifies this as a danger for Christians across the political spectrum. He says, quote, the woke evangelicals are just much more influenced by MSNBC and liberal Twitter. The conservative Christians are much more influenced by Fox News and their particular loops. And they're both living in those things eight to 10 hours a day. They go to church once a week. As Keller warns, the brand of news that we consume can become a defining feature of our identity. As consumers of news, we're in danger of developing a greater sense of camaraderie with those who laugh at Peter Sagel's jokes or get their news from Anderson Cooper than with members of our church who happen to vote for the wrong political party. Hegel's analogy between prayer and reading the morning paper is apt once again here. When our communities aren't formed around shared attention to God, other focal points spring up to compete for our attention and loyalty. So if the problem is that our belonging to one another has become increasingly mediated through the media and the public sphere, the solution may be to root our fundamental commitments outside this space. Now, this doesn't mean we can just opt out of the public square entirely. The public sphere is with us for better or worse, or more precisely, for better and worse. My diagnostic critique of this sphere in the previous chapters intended to help us discern how to foster healthier communities outside its confines. If the public sphere encourages unhealthy forms of belonging, secular, metatopical, market-based forms, we need to cultivate embodied forms of belonging and then allow these commitments to foster chirotic, topical, and convivial modes of participating in the public sphere. As much as possible, then, instead of allowing the news to create our communities, Christians should seek to help their communities create the news. As embodied human persons, our decision-making and actions are fundamentally shaped by the communities to which we belong. Recognizing this inescapable reality should cause us to consider carefully the news communities in which we participate. We will catch many of our core commitments and opinions from the sources that we read and the people with whom we discuss current events. So Christians should join with their neighbors and those in need, and then allow these commitments to guide their participation in the public sphere. Particularly in the past two centuries, as technological developments have made publishing relatively inexpensive, many Christians have done this by creating news organizations that publish the stories our communities and the broader culture need. There's a long and rich history here, but two exemplars I'll commend are Frederick Douglass and Dorothy Day. Both were influenced by early encounters with books and magazines that helped them imagine more Christian ways of belonging to their neighbors. They then founded newspapers to carry on this work of encouraging readers to foster convivial, gospel-oriented communities in their own places. Their examples demonstrate the redemptive possibilities that can come when we enter the public sphere while firmly rooted in commitments and communities formed outside its strictures. Once we acknowledge these fundamental realities about human cognition and the social nature of our thinking, the question remains, how do we improve our socially formed intuitions so that our prejudices and effective responses are more in line with the gospel? How do we belong to one another, even to those with whom we disagree, in redemptive ways? In many ways, this section on belonging is the most important part of this series of lectures. The most formative practices we engage in, particularly with regard to reading and discussing the news, are those practices that join us to other people and so define our communities. The company we keep and the topics of conversation we share with them determine our effective response to the news and shape the conclusions we come to. Daniel Kahneman puts the matter bluntly. For some of us, our most important Sorry, for some of our most important beliefs, we have no evidence at all. 
except that people we love and trust hold these beliefs. In their work on the formation of factions and partisanship, Danielle Allen and Justin Pottle similarly note, our reasoning shortcuts grow out of our immediate social environments. In other words, our various forms of shortcuts cuts are not idiosyncratic, they're social. The upshot of all this is that, as Alan Jacobs argues, we should take very seriously who we spend time with and think alongside. As Jacob writes, learning to feel as we should is enormously helpful for learning to think as we should. And this is why learning to think with the best people and not to think with the worst is so important. To dwell habitually with people is inevitably to adopt their way of approaching the world, which is a matter not just of ideas, but also of practices. In general terms, there are two sets of practices that can help us feel and think within healthy communities. The first category entails practices of joining that root our identity in embodied communities. The second category entails participating in the media in ways that might counter the particular warping pressures of the public sphere. So most fundamentally, healing the tribalism that marks our media ecology will require Christians to take up what Willie Jennings calls the incarnational practice of joining. The act of crossing racial or class or economic or ideological divides to belong with our fellow Christians and with our neighbors. Jennings offers a rich theology of joining, one that relies on recognizing place as an opportunity for redemptive engagement. He writes, the space of communion is always ready to appear where the people of God reach down to join the land and reach out to join those around them, their near and distant neighbors. Jennings goes on to challenge Christians whose communities have been fractured and marred by racism, pride, or selfishness to take up this work of jo joining to move into a neighborhood, worship on Sunday morning, or grow a garden with people who don't look or vote like you. Such work will not result in perfect agreement about all issues, but it might lead to empathy for those with whom we disagree, but to whom we now belong. Secondly, this work of joining can then form us to enter the public sphere in more redemptive ways. It does this by reshaping the directionality of our allegiances. Is our belonging in the public sphere dictated by our interactions with our fellow church members, relatives, and neighbors? Or are we entering the public sphere on the basis of our commitments to, to our neighbors, the least of these in the community and our fellow parishioners? Obviously, there will be some mutual influence. The stories we read in our newsfeed will affect our worship and our conversations with relatives or coworkers. But if we imagine ourselves as members of embodied communities, we'll be better equipped to then enter the public sphere redemptively while also resisting its particular warping pressures. The key question is what imagined community shapes our engagement with the news? If our primary allegiance is to our swarm in the public sphere, we'll be tempted to grandstand, signal our virtues, or own the libs, and we may want to get away from our benighted neighbors and go on vacation with those who then consume our preferred brand of news. If, however, we belong primarily to our places, we might wonder how a new citizenship policy will affect our immigrant neighbor, or how a new bus schedule could improve the lives of our neighbors who don't have cars. And there's a long tradition of Christians seeking to enter the public sphere while remaining firmly rooted in embodied theological communities. Christians have often been early adopters of new communications technologies because they have recognized the ways that these tools, Gutenberg's printing press, the industrial printing methods of the 19th century, radio, TV, now the internet, provide incredible opportunities to raise public consciousness about important issues and topics, to bind people together around shared attention to important issues of the day, and then to inspire acts of mercy and redemptive work and prayer. So redemptive Christian news organizations and authors find ways to subvert the deformative dynamics of the public sphere. They labor along the margins of a broken system, making do as best they can to inspire and equip readers to belong more faithfully to their own places and people. Whereas conversations in the public sphere tend, as we've seen, to be secular, metatopical, and market-based, these people and organizations host chirotic, topical, and convivial discussions. By chirotic, I mean that they publish evergreen stories and avoid being caught up in the topic of the day. Their horizon of significance is the arc of the Christian narrative rather than the 24-7 news cycle. One example of this would be the nonprofit profiles that World Magazine publishes each year for its Hope Awards. 
By topical, I mean that they don't try to cover every issue or give equal space to all perspectives. Instead, they have an orienting mission, one rooted in the gospel or even a specific facet of the gospel. As we'll discuss in a moment, Douglas's papers were committed to the abolition of slavery, and Day's Catholic work were traditionally focused on labor issues and pacifism. Such work is oriented by particular commitments that are rooted outside the public sphere. And finally, by convivial, I mean that these organizations aren't just chasing subscribers and advertisers, but are instead cultivating a community of discourse among their readers. Parada paradigmatic examples include Catholic Worker and Plow Quarterly, which is published by the Anabaptist Bruderhof community. These publications are published by Christians who actually live together. But many other publications hold conferences and gatherings, host private Facebook groups, or find other ways to foster genuine community among their readers and contributors. Participating in such news communities will shape our intuitions so that we're more likely to respond to stories and events with love rather than outrage, prayer rather than bitterness, and embodied action rather than telescopic morality. But looking at some exemplars can help us envision what this healthy interplay between media and community might look like. For both Frederick Douglass and Dorothy Day, reading books and papers transformed their lives, introducing them to new communities of discourse and action. Their reading led them to imagine new possibilities for joining with and working among the members of their own places. This membership, in turn, led them to speak publicly on behalf of their communities challenging others to belong redemptively to their own neighbors and to address the pressing issues of their time. In the opening editorial for his newspaper, The North Star, Douglas situated his paper as a communal endeavor, arguing that the black community must be our own representatives and advocates, not exclusively but peculiarly, not distinct from but in connection with our white friends. And thus, he wrote, it will not be committed to an ideology, but to a community, which he names as our long oppressed and plundered fellow countrymen. We shall cordially approve every measure and effort calculated to advance your sacred cause and strenuously oppose any, which in our opinion, may tend to retard its progress. Rather than being narrowly anti-slavery, Douglas wrote that the North Star will also discuss issues such as temperance, peace, capital punishment, and education. While advocating your rights, the North Star will strive to throw light on your duties. While it, will while it will not fail to make known your virtues, it will not shun to discover your faults. To be faithful to our foes, it must be faithful to ourselves in all things. Douglas's language of rights and duties is common in Republican discourse, but it emphasizes that Douglas was committed not just to an ideology or an interest group, but to the formation of a healthy community. Further, Douglas' advocacy on behalf of this community was rooted in his religious convictions. One version of the Liberator's masthead depicts Christ in his role as Liberator, proclaiming, I come to break the bonds of the oppressor. Similarly, the motto of Douglas's North Star declares, Right is of no sex, truth is of no color, God is the Father of us all, and all we are brethren. If Douglas belonged to his fellow oppressed countrymen and women, who was an early supporter of the suffrage movement, he belonged equally to the biblical prophetic tradition. As his biographer David Blight puts it, Douglas not only used the Hebrew prophets, he joined them. Douglas consistently rooted his own story, and especially the story of African Americans, in the oldest and most powerful stories of the Hebrew prophets. Douglas's political and social advocacy is unintelligible without this theological understanding of the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of all people. Dorothy Day is another exemplary figure here. She was born two years after Douglas died, and while she worked in a different era and context than Douglas did, her involvement with publishing in the news followed a similar arc. As a young woman, she worked for various socialist newspapers and became involved in labor activism. Yet, she, yet while she was finding her identity in these political causes, she was also drawn by the Christian vision of authors like Thomas Akempis, Augustine, and the contributors to the Catholic magazine, Messenger of the Sacred Heart. She particularly credits Dostoevsky and others as giving her the desire and background to join the church. As a new Catholic, they felt distance from her former socialist associates, who were mostly atheists, but she was also frustrated by the lack of concern her Catholic friends had for the poor. These frustrations led her to found the Catholic worker movement and newspaper. The paper, 
the houses of hospitality, the acts of mercy. These were all days means of ameliorating the loneliness and alienation that mark human life, particularly in an industrial society. As she writes, we have all known the long loneliness and we have learned that the only solution is love and that love comes with community. From her own experience, they learned that newspapers could help form convivial communities. And she devoted her life to a work that would have combined faithful joining with redemptive publishing. Day did not aspire to become a thought leader with a prominent platform. Instead, she cultivated a community and committed herself to the unglamorous, difficult work of institution building. Douglas and Day were two of the greatest advocacy journalists in American history, and both joined themselves to other Christians, particularly the oppressed and marginalized, and then sought to create the news from the perspective of these communities. Subscribers who read issue after issue of one of their papers could gradually come to belong to a readerly community and begin to imagine more faithful ways of joining with others in their own places. Reading such papers and writing essays or letters, donating funds, discussing the stories becomes a shared practice, a formative liturgy that aligns readers' effective responses with the gospel. Through these papers then, Douglas and Day help their readers participate in the public sphere not as atomized individuals swarming around titillating events, but as members of committed communities, rooted in the gospel and attentive to the needs of their particular places and times. As I suggested earlier, there are two broad sets of practices that might foster healthier forms of belonging. Practices of joining with our embodied communities and practices of redemptive participation in the public sphere. So I'll conclude by recommending one practice in each category, going for a walk, and subscribing aspirationally. There are any number of practices that could help us to root our identities outside the deformative spaces of the public sphere and belong more faithfully to our places. Attend and serve a church, volunteer at community organizations, even hang out in a local McDonald's. But the simplest way to begin may be by walking out your own front door. We live in a time when most trips through our neighborhoods begin by stepping into our car and when even these trips can be replaced by an order via Amazon or DoorDash. In this milieu, it can be a radical act to simply stroll through your neighborhood. More fundamentally, walking can be an antidote to the telescopic morality and disembodied communities that are forged through our screens. As Wendell Berry has it, if you want to see where you are, you will have to get out of your car, off your horse, and walk over the ground. Many people discover the joys of walking through their neighborhoods in the wake of the COVID-19 shutdowns. And perhaps that disruption can serve to revive this art of walking. Walking can join us to our places and neighbors, rooting our sense of community and belonging in relationships formed outside the confines of the public sphere. Walking allows us to experience our places at a human pace and scale. It gets us outside of our two-ton capsules of metal and glass and out from behind our six-ounce shields of metal and glass. As you walk, you might find yourself talking with a neighbor about a tree that fell down or about who moved into the house that was for sale into the street, or about the pestilential deer that keep eating your garden. The furor over the latest online outrage fades, and the reality and needs of your own place come into sharper focus. So the second practice is subscribing aspirationally. If subscribing to a paper is a kind of formative liturgy, we should be careful what publications we regularly read. Indeed, rather than diversifying our newsfeed and subscribing to papers across some artificial political spectrum, we should subscribe aspirationally. To what community do I want to belong? What newspaper or podcast or website gathers this community, articulating and shaping its values and perspectives? Because it's omnivorous and driven by a need to engage us, big news fractures our focus and then we flip from scandal to scandal. But smaller publications, like Douglas's and Day's, can give sustained attention to particular issues and, and gradually build a consensus around what's needed. So in some ways, the return of partisan publications may actually be a good thing. Similarly, local newspapers and community newsletters focus on news that matters to a particular place, and they can play a vital role in fostering a community's consciousness. Even in the digital age, local news remains valuable and in many places continues to thrive. In particular, look for and patronize those writers and institutions who attend to the news from a longer, deeper perspective. Don't give your money or attention to websites that promulgate clickbait. Don't get your news from TV. 
Its financial incentives are such that it's almost impossible for a TV station to be anything but a frenetic peekaboo show, in Neil Postman's phrase. This is a crucial consideration because the news shapes us not just through the arguments made by opinion columnists or talking heads, rather we're most deeply formed by the often unstated assumptions and the biases that guide which stories are covered and how those stories are framed. So when you watch or listen or read the news, you are catching a community's ways of thinking and feeling about the events of the day. Seek out organizations that operate on a longer wavelength. Not the moment-by-moment -moment chatter of Twitter, but the slower forms of thinking found in monthly or quarterly periodicals or even books. Some websites work against the internet's presentist secular bias by publishing book reviews and long-form essays. The key, I think, is to avoid consuming the news as an isolated spec spectator. It's this habit that's not only counterproductive, but can be downright toxic. By now, I hope I've convinced you that reading the news isn't a good in and of itself, but also that it can be an instrumental good to journeying well with our Christian and non-Christian neighbors. Indeed, journey is etymologically related to journal. Both derive from a Latin word meaning of or belonging to a day. At its best, the news provides the information and community that we need to journey well on our path toward God. Dorothy Day seems to have had this etymology in mind when she titled her column in The Catholic Worker, first day by day, and later, perhaps regretting the pun, change it to on pilgrimage. My friend Eric Miller makes even more explicit the transcendent goods that the news can serve. In a conference paper reflecting on the journal Tinoas and the community it sustained among those who, for all their disagreements with one another, were united by their rejection of modernity's reductive materialism, Eric concludes, that a crisis of such historic proportions should be met with a journal is curious. A journal is an exceedingly modest affair, after all, born of the hope that human beings, trailing one another from page to page, might just be listening and listening keenly to one another. Journals are quiet. But if the renewal of civilization or the academy or even a single soul certainly requires more than a journal, it's hard to imagine the success of such a journey, with, journey without it. Journaling together, day by day, we may just find ourselves nearer to that sacred place for which our fractured souls so palpably yearn. Reading the news will not save a single soul, but journals and the vibrant communities of wayfarers they gather can be indispensable guides as we seek to faithfully enact God's divine drama of redemption and our particular place and time. As T.S. Eliot has it, may we indeed fare forward together as we strive to apprehend the point of intersection of the timeless with time.